Professor William Lidwell. Professor Lidwell teaches interaction and industrial design at the Gerald D. Hines College of Architecture at the University of Houston. He received his MS in Interaction and Instructional Design from the University of Houston, Clear Lake. Professor Lidwell is the co-author of Deconstructing Product Design and the best-selling Universal Principles of Design. He is also the creator and original writer of the Makeshift column for Make Magazine and the co-editor of Guidelines for Excellence in Management. Professor Lidwell frequently speaks and consults with leading firms on matters of design and consumer experience, including Harris Entertainment Corporation, IKEA, Merrill Lynch, NCR Corporation, and Procter & Gamble. He currently serves as Director of Innovation and Development at the Stuff Creators Design Studio in Houston, Texas. Let's begin by going back in time. The year is 1665. The place, Cambridge, England. A student, just 23 years old, receives his bachelor's degree from Trinity College. He graduates without distinction. He is by all accounts an unexceptional student. Despite this, he has his sights set on graduate school. He wants to be a scientist. Now, unfortunately, the Great Plague of London is at its zenith at this time. The bubonic plague is killing thousands of people every week. The dead are being buried in large open pits. Pets are being rounded up and slaughtered. Fires are kept burning around the clock to try to stave off the contagion. People are panicked and fleeing the cities. Trinity College shuts down, and our young graduate is left with no way to continue his education. So he decides to go home to Lincolnshire, where he spends the next couple of years in self-study. The next 24 months are perhaps the most remarkable and intellectually productive in human history. Our student's name is Isaac Newton. During this period, Newton discovers the three laws of motion, formulates a universal law of gravity, and in order to explain the elliptical orbits of planets, invents differential and integral calculus. And by the way, he develops a theory of optics where he explores a question of special interest to us in these lectures. What is color? Now, like any good scientist, Newton begins devising experiments to answer this question. Early among them, he conducts an experiment where he sticks a bodkin, a hairpin that looks like a butter knife, into his eye socket, presses it around against his eyeball to see what, if any, colors he could see. This is what he wrote of the experience. I took a botkin and put it betwixt my eye and the bone as near to the back side of my eye as I could, and pressing my eye with the end of it so as to make the curvature in my eye, there appeared several white, dark, and colored circles. Of course, Newton saw the kind of color fireworks that you see when you rub your eyes. But other than that, in a pair of sore eyes, he didn't get much out of the experience. However, the next set of experiments would prove more fruitful. In these experiments, Newton shuts his wooden shutters to make the room pitch black, and then drills a single hole in the middle of one of the shutters so that just a small ray of sunlight could enter the room. He placed a prism, which is a small angular piece of glass in the path of the sunbeam, and the result is what Newton described as a colored image of the sun, essentially a rainbow image on his wall. Now, Newton wasn't the first person to do this. Others, others before him had used prisms to produce colors. But everyone at that time believed that the color came from the prism, not the light. In other words, the white light from the sun was believed to be pure, and impurities in the glass were believed to be the source of the colors. So the next step in the experiment is Newton's big breakthrough. He takes another prism and places it behind the first prism right where the blue light is emitted. Would another rainbow be created? Would the impurities of the glass affect the colors in the same way? The same exact blue light was emitted. 
Newton concludes that color is not caused by impurities in the prism glass, but that the prism glass was splitting the white light into its constituent parts. So what are colors? Colors, according to Newton, are just different wavelengths of light, parts of white light. But it turns out it is a bit trickier than this. For example, when we say we see a red object, like an apple, the apple appears red to us because the surface of the apple is reflecting red light and absorbing the other colors. In other words, the apple itself isn't really red. If anything, it's accepting the blue, green, yellow wavelengths of light and rejecting the red wavelengths. If anything, we should call it anti-red. And then there's the matter of how our eyes interpret these different wavelengths. Now, most people have three types of color receptor cells in their eyes called cones. One for red, one for green, and one for blue. No matter what wavelengths of light are actually received by our eyes, our cones only interpret a tiny fraction of them. And then there's the matter of how our brains interpret and respond to the signals received from our cones. When we speak of seeing a color or experiencing a color, what we really are talking about is what our brain does with these signals transmitted from our cones. The objective definitions of colors may lie without, in the outside world, but the meanings of colors most certainly lie within, in our brains. So that's what we're going to focus on in these lectures. How our brains interpret the signals from our cones and how these signals influence our thoughts, emotions, and actions. Let's consider an example. Let's repeat a popular experiment that demonstrates how color influences our perception of taste. So we need a table and now four glass bowls. And we need to fill each bowl with a food of some sort. Now, these experiments have been done with all sorts of foods, pudding, cereals, pastries. For this experiment, let's fill ours with unflavored gelatin, basically colorless jello. Good. Now let's add food coloring to each of the bowls. We'll make this one red, this one yellow, this one green, and this one blue. The food coloring we use is odorless and flavorless. Sometimes in these experiments, they confirm this with blind taste tests. Basically, you blindfold people, have them taste each of the jellos, and see if they can detect any flavor difference. When we do this, we confirm that they can't. There is no detectable odor or flavor difference. Now we're ready for the color experiment. We allow our tasters to see all four bowls of jello, to take a taste of each of them, and then describe what they taste. Very consistently, across age groups, this is what we find. When people taste the red jello, they describe it as sweet, tasting like strawberries. When people taste the yellow jello, they describe it as sour, like a lemon. When people taste the green jello, they describe it as tart, like a green apple. And when people taste the blue jello, they describe it as odd tasting, maybe like a coconut. The blue jello is always considered to be the least tasty of the bunch. This is because we've evolved to associate dark colors such as blue and black with rotten or spoiled food. Now for me, the best part of this experiment is when the experimenters tell the tasters that the different bowls of jello are actually identical. That is, they taste the same, they're just different colors. Their reaction? They don't believe it. They think that the experimenter is tricking them or lying to them, or that the food coloring really does have a taste. Kids don't believe it, teens don't believe it, and adults don't believe it. But what we need to realize, and indeed, this is the most important part, is that they experienced the flavors they described. Their brain responded the same way it would have had the red jello actually been sweet, the yellow sour, the green tart, and the blue yucky. The lesson, we taste with our eyes long before we taste with our mouths. And color is a powerful visual cue that tells our brain what food tastes like. Let's consider some real world products where we can see this effect in action, for good and for bad. Do you like Cheetos? Did you know that without artificial coloring, the color of Cheetos is actually gray? 
Let's look at some naturally colored and artificially colored Cheetos side by side. Now, ask yourself, how popular do you think Cheetos would be if they were sold in their natural state? Not very. Do you remember clear colas like Crystal Pepsi? Product was introduced in the 1990s. The idea was to present a caffeine-free soda that looked pure. Coca-Cola had a version too. It was called Tab Clear. Now, the idea of a clear soda makes some sense. It even sounds like a good idea. Who wouldn't want a pure drink? And clear does look pure. And it was unique looking, surely better than brown cola. In fact, the Crystal Pepsi tagline was, you've never seen a taste like this. Now, consider this in light of the experiment we just ran. Remember, we taste largely with our eyes. A clear soda does not tell us anything about how it tastes. If anything, it tells us it tastes like water. So their tagline was true in a way. Right? Customers had never seen a taste like this. In fact, they couldn't see a taste at all. And that was the problem. The product failed repeatedly. There have been attempts to rebrand it and try again because it seems like such a good idea. Pure clear cola. Somebody should want it. But customers weren't and aren't buying it. Literally. One more example. Colored ketchup. In 2000, Heinz introduced a ketchup product called Easy Squirt Blast and Green. As you can guess from its name, the ketchup was green. More than 10 million bottles were sold of this ketchup in the first seven months following its introduction. This was the highest sales increase in the brand's history. Color experts and brand consultants are often quick to jump on the success and tout it as an example of how color can solve the world's problems. But, as is so often the case, when you look more closely, there's more to the story. And success is often in the details. First, as a color for ketchup, the color green was unique, but it was also what we call congruent, meaning that it made sense with what we know about tomatoes. After all, there are green tomatoes. Second, shortly after the introduction of green ketchup, Heinz co-branded their ketchup and promoted it with the release of a blockbuster movie called Shrek. Now, for those of you who may have missed it, Shrek was a hilarious green ogre who, among other things, ate really gross things. Eating gross things was part of the fun of the character. Green ketchup on food was not only congruent with green tomatoes, which helped parents feel okay about buying it, but it was congruent with Shrek in eating gross-looking meals which made it fun and desirable for kids. Put all this together, and voila, you sell a lot of ketchup. However, if you don't really understand the cause and effect here, you might draw the wrong conclusion, like colors are just cool, or kids and their parents just like eating funky colored ketchup, and so on. The conclusion that Heinz drew, and I quote, the tremendous success of Heinz Easy Squirt Blast in Green showed us that kids love decorating their food with colors that are bright, wild, and even a little funky. So Heinz came out with other colored ketchups, purple, pink, orange, teal, a mystery color, and last but not least, blue. Okay, let's take a look at some of the lessons we just learned, apply them, and see if we can predict what happened. One, unlike red and green ketchups, these colors did not have good congruency with tomatoes. That means they were less appealing to parents. Two, they didn't have a popular movie association to engage kids. Shrek made green and gross cool. There was no Shrek for purple, orange, or teal, so there's no congruency for kids between these colored ketchups and something positive. And three, as we learned in our Jello experiment, Colors like purple and blue are not innately appealing in eating contexts. They remind us of rotten, spoiled, moldy food. So when you add up one, two, and three, what do you get? A condiment that makes whatever food you put it on look a little gross, with no congruent appeal for either parents or children. What happened? Not surprisingly, sales dropped off in the years after Shrek and Heinz discontinued color ketchups altogether in 2006. These are the types of mistakes that occur when you don't fully understand the meanings of colors, the meanings we take from colors, and the meanings we give to them. 
And to develop this deeper understanding, we must first understand three big ideas that form the foundation of how all humans perceive, interpret, and respond to colors. Big idea one. Colors mean different things to different parts of the brain. Psychologists often distinguish between two basic modes of thinking, which are commonly referred to as System 1 and System 2. These systems are made up of what are effectively little computer programs in our brain, kind of like apps on your smartphone. They're obviously not literally computer programs, but functionally speaking, they act very much like them. Now, these programs sit idling around, just waiting for the right stimulus to come along. When the right stimulus is perceived, maybe it's a sound, a smell, or a sight, the corresponding program in our brain steps up and says, I got this. That program then executes, and whatever corresponding influence it may have on our thoughts, emotions, and actions occurs. Okay, so we have the metaphor of cognitive programs. Now let's compare the difference between System 1 and System 2 programs. System 1 programs are fast, automatic, and typically outside of our control. They act reflexively. We're either born with System 1 programs, such as instincts, or develop them through lots of practice. Examples of System 1 programs include fight or flight responses, fear of heights, spiders, and snakes, performing simple calculations like 1 plus 1, detecting angry faces in a crowd, and riding a bicycle for experienced riders, highly practiced. System 1 programs require little or no attention or cognitive effort. They often occur beneath our conscious awareness. System 2 programs are slow, require attention and deliberation, and are typically within our control. They are learned. With enough practice, System 2 programs can become System 1 programs. Examples of System 2 thinking include writing a persuasive essay, counting the number of words on a page, performing complex calculations like 2,487 divided by 32, detecting a face with a small idiosyncrasy like a mole, riding a bicycle, but this time for novice riders. System 2 programs require our conscious attention and significant cognitive effort. When we see colors, our experience is the result of a combination of our System 1 and System 2 programs. For example, we appear to be born with certain System 1 programs that respond to the color red with fear. Thus, in certain contexts, red means avoid. That means that when you see the color red, one of your System 1 programs tells you to avoid the red object. Because the source of this program is instinctive, a product of our evolution, it is true for all people everywhere. Now, you may have other programs in your brain that agree or disagree with this one. When they agree, we say the response is congruent, and the overall response is reinforced. When programs disagree, we say the response is incongruent, and the overall response is interfered with or dampened. For example, assume you grew up in a culture where red means stop. Right? When you learn this, a little program is created in your brain that tells you to stop every time you see red. Now, since this meaning is congruent with your System 1 program for avoid, the two programs reinforce one another. But now, let's assume that you grew up in a culture where red means welcome. Now, when you learn this, like before, a little program was created in your brain that tells you to approach every time you see the color red. Since this meaning is incongruent with your System 1 program for avoid, the two programs conflict with one another. The overall effect is dampened. And if an incongruent program, like red meaning welcome, is practiced and reinforced enough, it becomes a System 1 program that can potentially overwhelm other programs. Let's look at an experiment that demonstrates this kind of incongruence. Classic experiment in placebo research. Placebo is an inert treatment like a sugar pill. It doesn't really do anything, but the patient doesn't know it. Anyway, in the experiment, you give two groups placebos in the form of a pill. The pills, same shape, same size, but one is colored red and one is colored blue. Consistently, the red pills wake people up. The blue pills put people to sleep. Now, experiments testing this have been repeated many times all over the world, always with the same result, except in one place, Italy. 
In Italy, the blue pills do put the women to sleep, but not the men. Now, why would this be? The answer, the Italian national football team, and that's soccer for Americans, is called Azure, the blues. They wear blue uniforms, and Italian men are crazy about soccer. Accordingly, the Italian men have developed programs that respond to blue with excitement that are so strong that they overwhelm the System 1 tranquilizing effect. This is one reason past research on color is so inconsistent. Understanding that a single color can mean different things to different parts of the brain at the same time, it's a relatively new concept, and it's very difficult to control experimentally. Since innate responses to color are universal, that is, the same for all humans everywhere, and socially conditioned meanings can vary across cultures and across individuals, these lectures will focus exclusively on innate System 1 meanings of colors. This understanding will give us the general rules with the caveat that there will be exceptions, as with our Italian football fans. Now, before I go on, are you curious about the effects of other colored placebos? Here's the rundown. Red pills are best at waking you up. Blue pills are best at putting you to sleep. Yellow pills are best at treating depression. Green pills are best at reducing anxiety. And white pills are best at soothing ulcers. So, that's big idea one. Colors mean different things to different parts of the brain. We're going to focus on meanings driven by the parts of the brain that are innate System 1 programs in these lectures. Big idea number two. Colors mean different things in different contexts. The cognitive programs that interpret colors are context-specific. This means the same color can mean different things in different contexts, and there are separate cognitive programs for each context. So, for example, if you ask people what their favorite color is, most reply blue. Blue is the world's most popular color. Now, why would this be? A general preference for blue could be because blue water signals purity, meaning it's safe to drink. Our ancestors, who evolved a preference for it, would have been less likely to suffer illness related to contaminated water. Given the ubiquitous need for pure water, the preference for the color generalized. I should note that nobody is really sure why blue is the most popular color, but it is. And the pure water hypothesis is one possible explanation. So that's the general context for blue. But if you're looking at the color of foods, Blue elicits the most negative response of all colors. As we learned in our Jell-O experiment, we have a negative visceral response to blue and purple food. It means spoiled or rotten food. So when Heinz asked children in focus groups what color ketchup they would like to see next, the children responded using their general color preferences. Blue, because in an abstract context, that is their favorite color. But this turns out to be the worst possible color for food. Why didn't the cognitive program for food, the one that dislikes blue, speak up in the focus groups? Well, in order to activate the food context program, you would actually need to sit children in front of food with blue ketchup on it, or at least show them a picture of food with blue ketchup on it. Absent this context, it is an abstract question, and you end up getting information from the wrong cognitive program. And as Heinz found out, this can translate to many millions of dollars. Let's consider another context. In an experiment comparing the effects of colored clothing on physical attractiveness, the same females were presented to males in different colored shirts. Males rated their attractiveness on a scale of 1 to 7. The women in blue scored significantly lower than women in either black or red. Now, if the goal is to be physically attractive as possible, blue is not the best color to wear, probably because blue relates to bluish skin, a sign of poor fertility and poor health. So we have one program in our brain for general contexts, and it likes blue. One program in our brain specifically for food contexts, and it doesn't like blue. And another program for mate selection, and it doesn't really care for blue either. Now, aside from the fact that the meaning of blue varies across these contexts, you may have detected another pattern here. All of the cognitive programs I just referenced had some adaptive significance at some point in our evolutionary past. This is important. Let me repeat. We only expect innate meanings for colors in contexts that had adaptive significance in our evolutionary past. At some point in human evolution, 
an ancestral response to color promoted survival or reproduction in some significant way. And that trait has been passed down to modern humans. Given this, we should not expect all colors to have meanings in all contexts. Further, some colors will have more meanings and more context than other colors, and some colors in some contexts may have no meanings at all. Understanding that a single color can mean different things, and sometimes even nothing, in different contexts is, again, a relatively new discovery, difficult to control experimentally. There is no way to broadly generalize the meaning of colors across contexts. You just can't do it. So, big idea number two, colors mean different things in different contexts. Now, big idea number three. Human languages develop categories or words for colors in the same order everywhere. The most limited color vocabulary of any language is black and white which corresponds to light and dark, or night and day. If a language does not have words for any other color, they always have words for black and white. When cultures have only three terms for colors, red is always the third term. Yellow is always fourth, green fifth, and blue is sixth. There are rare exceptions, but this sequence is, for all intents and purposes, universal. When you look at ancient texts and follow the evolution of their languages, the oldest languages, Greek, Chinese, Norse, Latin, Hebrew, they all began with simple color vocabularies. And as you trace the evolution of literature in these languages, and you track the addition of new words for colors, they follow the same basic sequence. Black, white, then red, yellow, green, and blue. Nobody knows for sure why languages acquire terms for color in this sequence. It could be based on some unknown adapted need. It could be based on how easy it was to make pigments. That is, we didn't develop words for colors until we developed pigments for them and needed to be able to refer to them. Nobody's really sure. One thing we are sure about, however, is that having words for categories of colors, having a way to think about and use a specific color, seems to tune and refine the color interpreting ability of our brains for those colors. Now, this is a really weird, wild thing. It's not just about having words for colors. This literally means that a culture that does not have a word for a color does not experience that color. That is, they see it with their eyes, but they can't see it with their brains. To get a better sense of this, let's run through one of the classic experiments in color research. For this experiment, we traveled to northern Namibia, country in southern Africa to visit the Himba tribe. The Himba language has only four or five words to describe colors, categories that mix colors that Westerners think of as distinct. For example, the Himba word Zuzu is a category that includes what we would call reds, greens, blues, and purples. In conversation, researchers would ask members of the tribe questions like, well, what color's water? And they would say white. What color's the sky? and they would say black, and so on. So, the Himba describe colors differently, but how do they actually see colors? Or rather, how does their brain experience colors? To test this, researchers show tribe members a computer screen with a bunch of colored squares, all the same color, but one. They then ask them to identify the one that's different. They measure how long it takes them to find the different color, and how many mistakes they make along the way. So, Let's look at a sample screen. On this screen, you see 12 colored squares. The task, pick the one square that's a different color. Show this screen to Westerners, and it takes them a long time to find the difference. And they often pick the wrong one. Long time, lots of errors. Conclusion is that Westerners' brains aren't tuned to see the difference between these two colors. We see them as the same color. Show this same screen to the Himba, however, and they quickly and easily pick out the different colored square. It's this one. The color categories used by the Himba have tuned their brains to see these color differences easily. Now, let's try another. Again, a screen with 12 colored squares. Pick the one square that's a different color. Now, unless you're colorblind, you can see that the blue square is clearly different from the other green squares. It couldn't be more obvious. 
Westerners pick the different colored square quickly and easily with a very low error rate. Our brains are tuned to see the blue and green as different colors, which is why we can discriminate between them so easily. Show this same screen to the Himba, however, and they struggle to find the different colored square. They look at the researchers as if they think they're being tricked. The color vocabulary of the Himba does not include blue, and this means that their brains are not tuned to see the shade of blue as different from the shade of green. Just as we were unable to distinguish between the two colors in the first trial, they are unable to distinguish them in the second. Now, the implications are profound. The language we use tunes our brains to see the colors we see. And this happens in a universally sequential way across all humans. First black and white, then red, then yellow, green, and finally blue. So we have three big ideas. Idea one, colors mean different things to different parts of the brain. Idea two, colors mean different things in different contexts. And then idea three, human languages develop categories and words for colors in the same order everywhere. And now that we've been exposed to the kinds of research we'll be examining in this lecture series, it's important we take note of a critical fact. There is no other area of design, architecture, or psychology that is more rife with myth, misinformation, and misunderstanding than the meanings of colors. There's a quote by the humorist Josh Billings, a contemporary of Mark Twain, who said, It ain't so much the things we don't know that get us into trouble. It's the things we know that just ain't so. This is very true. So these lectures are going to be as much about what colors don't mean, that is, what you may have learned that just ain't so, as about what they do mean. And to reinforce the way humans acquire color categories, the lecture sequence will follow the order of color acquisition. First, the black and white lecture, because they always come as a pair, then the red lecture, and the yellow lecture, and the green lecture, and then lastly, the blue lecture. Every lecture will follow a consistent architecture. We'll begin by briefly exploring the history and common usage of, of the color. We'll examine and bust some of the biggest myths regarding that color. We'll review what we do know about the meanings of that color based on sound scientific research. And then finally, we'll discuss context and strategies to help you use colors in practice. Perhaps you're starting a company and you're trying to figure out the right colors to use for your website and logo. Maybe you are painting a room in your home or office, and you want to make sure the color selected supports the intended use of that room. Perhaps you're wondering what color clothes you should wear on a job interview, or a sales call, or maybe even a first date. We'll explore these applications and more in the lectures that follow. I'd like to end by sharing a favorite quote of mine by the great painter Mark Rothko. Rothko, if you don't know, painted huge, beautiful, abstract rectangles of color, referred to as multiforms. Rothko says, The fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my picture shows that I can communicate those basic human emotions. The people who weep before my pictures are having the same religious experience I had when I painted them. And if, as you say, are moved only by their color relationships, then you miss the point. Rothko intuitively understood that colors could be used to move emotions, to activate those instinctive programs in our brains. And in the forthcoming lectures, we're going to learn how to use some of the same tools and tricks that Rothko had in his toolbox, and much more.